Marx and Satan, Chapter 8 Angels of Light The Satanist Mass Dr. Lawrence Pazder in Michelle Remembers gives us the exact words of a highly secret Satanist Mass obtained through regression analysis from a girl who had attended such some 20 years before. In the Mass, Satan appears and says, quote, Out of dark and fire red comes a man of living dead. I only walk the earth at night. I only burn out the light. I only go where everybody's afraid. I go and find the ones who've strayed. All the darkest forces, they are mine. Turn a light, make it night. End quote. Satan is obviously personified by the high priest of the sect. Then Satan takes a Bible in his hand and says, quote, No eyes can see what this book said. What's written in the book is dead. No eyes can see, not even a friend. The books are mine in the end. You can write all day, you can write all night, but writing won't bring light. I'll burn it out, I'll make it black. I'll burn your words from front to back. I'll burn each page, I'll eat each word, and spit it out, never to be heard. The fire will grow, their eyes will see. The book of words can't stand up to me. When they grow old, they'll know and tell. The only power comes from hell. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John burn in the fire, and then you're gone. Their words were lies, my children will see. In the fire, their word dies. The only thing left burning true is the light that shows me to you. I'll be back, you wait and see. I'll be back to take the world for me. Everything that's gone must return. I was thrown out, but I can burn. Turn, my children, turn around. Touch every piece of ground. Touch every one you can. Make a beast of every man. End quote. Then follows the chant of the congregation, quote, It's time to change from black to red. It's time to change from alive to dead. Prince of darkness, help us celebrate the feast of the coming of the beast. End quote. Satan speaks again, quote, The Holy One, the One Most High, Ha! Not for long. Pretty soon it will be I. All the countries you see, I put my traps, waiting for the boot to collapse. Money and numbers and the power of hate, these are the things on which I relate. Numbers of people, so many, each one small. Then, with so much money, the small are tall. End quote. Friedrich Nietzsche, in the fourth part of Thus Spake Zarathustra, under Awakening, provides the text of another black mass he himself composed. Its spirit does not differ much from the one above. Tragically, it has come to light that black masses have infiltrated the lives of many Americans, especially children. Satan, Satan, Satan. He is God, he is God, he is God. These blasphemous words are hidden in the lyrics of rock records that youth listen to by the hour, many with no awareness of what they are being subjected to. The words are hidden in the lyrics through backward masking. A number of rock groups have used this technique. Led Zeppelin's best-selling record, Stairway to Heaven, which admittedly makes little sense as written, contains the masked message, I will sing because I live with Satan. Another song contains the words, I decide to smoke marijuana. Subliminal persuasion is more powerful and therefore more dangerous than conscious influence. Public black masses are rare today, but Stefan Zweig, in his biography of Fouché, describes one held in Lyon during the French Revolution. A revolutionary, Chalier, had been killed and the black mass was celebrated in his honour. On that day, crucifixes were torn from all the altars and priestly robes were confiscated. A huge crowd of men carrying a bust of the revolutionary descended on the marketplace. Three proconsuls were there to honour Chalier, the god-saviour who died for the people. The crowd carried chalices, holy images, and utensils used in the mass. Behind them was an ass wearing a bishop's mitre on its head. A crucifix and a bible had been tied to its tail. In the end, the gospel was thrown into the fire together with missals, prayer books, and icons. The ass was made to drink from a communion chalice as a reward for its blasphemous service. The bust of Chalier was put on an altar in place of the smashed image of Christ. Tens of former Catholic priests participated. 
A medal was issued to commemorate this event. Secret black masses do not take this shape, but the spirit is basically the same. The Russian magazine Uniai Communist describes in detail a Satanist mass in which bread and wine mixed with dung and tears taken from operating on the eyes of a living cock are transubstantiated into the alleged body and blood of Lucifer. During this ceremony, the words of the mass are read from end to beginning, as is customary in Satanist rituals. Then a covenant is concluded between Satan and his worshippers. The points of the contract are Renunciation of Christian teaching New baptism in the name of the devil with a change of name Renunciation of godparents with the substitution of other protectors Bringing some personal clothing as a gift to Satan Swearing loyalty to Satan while standing in a magic circle Inscription of the new member's name in the Book of the Dead as opposed to Christ's Book of Life The promise to consecrate one's children to the devil as well as gifts and deeds pleasing to him an oath to keep the secrets of the witch's coven and to demean the Christian religion. Why would communists dig out such teachings from old books of demonology and recommend them to the youth, saying they are rich food for thought? Is that all that Marxism has to offer the human mind? The communist magazine continues, quote, In this devilish anti-world, which externally is completely like ours, man must reply with evil to every success in life. End quote. Then it brazenly affirms the following as the slogan of Satanism. Satan is not the foe of man, he is life, love and light. The article ends with a quotation from Uspensky expressing the hope of the communists. Quote, There are ideas which touch the most intimate corners of our lives. Once these are touched, the marks remain forever. They will poison life. End quote. This insidious material is presented in a subtle manner, as if to provide information, but its real aim is to arouse the reader's morbid curiosity with ravaging effects. During the initiation ceremony for the third degree in the Satanist church, the initiate has to take the oath, I will always do only what I will. In other words, there is no authority beyond the polluted self. This is an open denial of God's commandment. Seek not after your own heart and your own eyes, after which you used to go a-whoring. Numbers, chapter 15, verse 39. Marxists appeal to the basest passions, stirring up envy toward the rich and violence toward everyone. It is the evil side which makes history, wrote Marx, and he played a major role in shaping history. Revolutions do not cause love to triumph, rather killing becomes a mania, in the Russian and Chinese revolutions, after the communists had murdered tens of millions of innocents, they could not stop murdering and brutally killing one another. Is everything permitted? The Satanist cult is very old, older than Christianity. The prophet Isaiah might have had it in view when he wrote, We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him, the Saviour, the iniquity of us all. Isaiah Chapter 53, verse 6. True religious feeling is at the opposite pole. Certainly, Hasidic rabbis never said I because they considered it a pronoun that belonged only to God. His will is binding on human behavior. By contrast, when a man or woman is initiated into the seventh degree of Satanism, he swears that his principle will be nothing is true and everything is permitted. When Marx filled out a quiz game for his daughter, he answered the question, which is your favourite principle, with the words, doubt everything. Marx wrote in the Communist Manifesto that his aim was the abolition not only of all religions, but also of all morals, which would make everything permissible. It was with a sense of horror that I read the mystery of the seventh degree of Satanism inscribed on a poster at the University of Paris during the 1968 riots. It had been simplified to the formula, it is forbidden to forbid, which is the natural consequence of nothing is true and everything is permissible. The youth obviously did not realise the stupidity of the formula, if it is forbidden to forbid, it must also be forbidden to forbid forbidding. If everything is permissible, forbidding is permissible too. Young people think that permissiveness means liberty. Marxists know better. To them, the formula means that it is forbidden to forbid cruel dictatorships like those in Red China and the Soviet Union. Dostoevsky had said it already. 
If there is no God, everything is permitted. If there is no God, our instincts are free. The ultimate expression of this kind of liberty is hatred. Whoever is free in this sense considers loving kindness a weakness of the spirit. Engels said, generalized love of men is absurdity. The anarchist thinker Max Stirner, author of The I and Its Property, and one of Marx's friends, wrote, I am legitimately authorized to do everything I am capable of. Communism is collective demon possession. Solzhenitsyn in the Gulag Archipelago reveals some of its horrible results in the souls and lives of people. The Mythical Marx Let me say again that I am conscious that the evidence I have given to date may be considered circumstantial. But what I have written is enough to show that what Marxists say about Karl Marx is a myth. He is not prompted by concern for the poverty of his fellow men, for which revolution was the only solution. He did not love the proletariat, but called them nuts, stupid, asses, rascals, even obscenities. He did not even love his comrades in the fight for communism. He called Freilograth the swine, Lasalle Jewish nigger, and Bakunin a theoretical zero. A Lieutenant Chekhov, a fighter in the Revolution of 1848, who spent nights drinking with Marx, commented that Marx's narcissism had devoured everything good that had been in him. Marx certainly did not love mankind. Giuseppe Mazzini, who knew him well, wrote that he had a destructive spirit, his heart bursts with hatred rather than with love toward men. Mazzini was himself a carbonari, this organization, founded in 1815 by Magella, a Genoan Freemason, declared its final aim to be that of Voltaire and of the French Revolution, the complete annihilation of Catholicism and ultimately of Christianity. It began as an Italian operation, but subsequently developed a broader European orientation. Though Mazzini was critical of Marx, he maintained his friendship with him. The Jewish Encyclopedia says that Mazzini and Marx were entrusted with the task of preparing the address and the constitution of the First International. This means that they were birds of the same feather, though they sometimes pecked at each other. I know of no testimonies from Marx's contemporaries that contradict Mazzini's evaluation. Marx, the loving man, is a myth constructed only after his death. In fact, his favourite bit of verse was this quotation from G. Worth. There is nothing more beautiful in the world than to bite one's enemies. In his own words, he said outright, We are pitiless, we ask for no pity. When our turn comes, we will not shun terrorism. These are hardly the sentiments of a lover. Marx did not hate religion because it stood in the way of the happiness of mankind. On the contrary, he simply wanted to make mankind unhappy in this world and throughout eternity. He proclaimed this as his ideal. His avowed aim was the destruction of religion. Socialism, concern for the proletariat, humanism, these were only pretexts. After Marx had read The Origin of Species by Charles Darwin, he wrote a letter to La Salle in which he exalts that God, in the natural sciences at least, had been given the death blow. What idea, then, preempted all others in Marx's mind? Was it the plight of the poor proletariat? If so, of what possible value was Darwin's theory? The only tenable conclusion is that Marx's chief aim was the destruction of religion. The good of the workers was only a pretense. Where proletarians do not fight for socialist ideals, Marxists will exploit racial differences or the so-called generation gap. The main thing is, religion must be destroyed. Marx believed in hell, and his program, the driving force in his life, was to send men to hell. Robin Goodfellow Marx wrote, quote, In the signs that bewilder the middle class, the aristocracy and the prophets of regression, we recognize our brave friend, Robin Goodfellow, the old mole that can work in the earth so fast, the revolution. End quote. Scholars who have read this apparently never looked into the identity of this Robin Goodfellow, Marx's brave friend, the worker for revolution. The 16th century evangelist William Tyndale used Robin Goodfellow as a name for the devil. 
Shakespeare, in his Midsummer Night's Dream, called him the knavish spirit that misleads night wanderers laughing at their harm. Thus, according to Marx, considered the father of communism, a demon was the author of the communist revolution and was his personal friend. Lenin's Tomb In his revelation to St. John, Jesus said something very mysterious to the church in Pergamos, a city in Asia Minor. I know where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. Revelation chapter 2 verse 13. Pergamos was apparently a centre of the Satanist cult in that period. Now, the world-famous Baedeker tourist guidebooks for Berlin state that the Island Museum contained the Pergamos altar of Zeus until 1944. German archaeologists had excavated it, and it had been in the centre of the Nazi capital during Hitler's Satanist regime. But the saga of the seat of Satan is not yet over. Svenska Dagbladet, Stockholm, for January 27, 1948, reveals that 1. The Soviet army, after the conquest of Berlin, carried off the Pergamos altar from Germany to Moscow. This tremendous structure measures 127 feet long by 120 feet wide by 40 feet high. Surprisingly, the altar has not been exhibited in any Soviet museum. For what purpose was it transported to Moscow? We have already indicated that men in the top echelons of the Soviet hierarchy practice Satanist rituals. Have they reserved the Pergamos altar for their private use? There are many unanswered questions. Suffice it to say that objects of such high archaeological value usually do not disappear, but are the pride of museums. 2. The architect Stuyusev, who built Lenin's mausoleum, used this altar of Satan as a model for the mausoleum in 1924. Thousands of Soviet citizens wait in line every day to visit the sanctuary of Satan in which Lenin's mummy lies in state. Religious leaders of the whole world pay their homage to the Soviet patron saint in this monument erected to Satan. Not a day goes by without wreaths of flowers being brought here, whereas the Christian churches on the Red Square in Moscow have long since been turned into museums. Satan rules in the Soviet Union in a highly visible manner. The Satanist temple at Pergamos was only one of the many of its kind. Why did Jesus single it out? Probably not because of the minor role it played at that time. Rather, his words were prophetic. He spoke about Nazism and communism, through which this altar would be honoured. It is worth noting with irony that on the grave of Lenin's father there stood a cross with the inscription, The light of Christ illuminates all and a multitude of Bible verses.